this is ancient city. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ancient city, yeah, of Central Asia. So some of you may have heard of Uzbekistan before. Some of you may have uh, even knew that it used to be part of the Soviet Union. It used to be one of the 15 Soviet republics that comprised Soviet Union. But uh, maybe not all of you have known that um, Uzbekistan, in fact, has a history that spans over, you know, few millennia. So um, let's dive into the presentation and I'll be, I think I'll be able to um, share my screen, right? Share it. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Perfect. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, here it is. So, the mysterious land that lies between two great rivers of Amudarya and Sardarya has been called Uzbekistan, but Earlier than that, it was called Transoxiana during the Hellenic period and used to be called Maura Nahar, which means uh, the land between two ri rivers in Arabic during the Arabic invasion. So it had many names over the centuries. We're gonna talk a little bit about the history. So I'll try to cover some of the brightest moments of Uzbekistan's history. We'll talk a little bit of geography, about Uzbek people, our culture, We'll touch on our food, Uzbek cuisine, and uh, famous sites. And we'll wrap it up by watching a YouTube video that's called Why You Should Visit Uzbekistan. So, all right. Yeah, perfect. Okay, there it is. Hopefully by the end of the presentation, you guys will have learned something interesting and new for you. So the first recorded sellers um, that um, founded kingdoms of Bactria, Sogdia, Chorezm, and Fergana and Margiana were Scythians. And that dates back to eighth and sixth centuries BC. The kingdoms were ruled by patriarchal families. And may, you may have heard about uh, some of those um, ancient kingdoms through uh, Hollywood movies. So have you guys watched um, the movie Alexander by Oliver Stone? Anyone? Um, it was about the Alexander the Great and his invasions. Uh, well, he's technically his uh, period of life when he conquered Persia, when he invaded Central Asia and his foray into India. So there was a moment when he found the love of his life, Roxana, and uh, the actress playing Roxana was Rosario Dawson. And uh, why am I talking about this? The reason behind this, she was a Bactrian princess. She was a daughter of the Bactrian nobleman. And um, basically we can say that she came from Uzbekistan. Yeah. So following Alexander's conquests um, of Central Asian lands, the kingdoms have been under Hellenic influence uh, for a period of time, which ended by uh, a period of Arabic invasion which started in 7th and 8th century AC. So early Muslim conquests turned a lot of um, the population, the majority of population into um, Islam. Uh, the population was converted into Islam and cities like Kiva, Samarkand and Bukhara that you can see behind me, um, they were located the, uh, along the Great Silk Route that connected China with Europe and that, that, that period of Arabic invasion had seen the birth of Islamic Golden Age, as we call it. Um, I'll talk, I mean, there was a huge number of scholars and scientists that um, have done great inventions that changed the history of the humankind, but um, I'm going to touch on certain people that were born, let's say, on the territory of modern Uzbekistan. They were Imam Bukhari, as you can see from his name. Uh, we had Abu Rayhan al-Biruni, he's a father of modern geodesy. Ibn Sina Avicenna, he's a father of modern medicine. Um, Muhammad ibn Musa al-Harazmi, um, he's a father of algebra, of modern day algebra. So um, they were among the brightest scholars of the golden age. The Golden Age ended with the start of Mongol invasion in the, in the 13th century, and that invasion period lasted um, a little over a century. But another period of Timurid Renaissance has started with the rule of Amir Timur. 
um, who was born in 1336. Um, and Amir Timur, he was a founder of a Timurid empire and he was regarded as the world's um, greatest military leaders and tacticians of his time. And he was also a grandfather of another great scholar, the renowned mathematician Mirza Lugbek. Uh, he not only was a mathematician, but he was also an astronomer. He was notable for his work in ast astronomy related mathematics, such as trigonometric and uh, spherical uh, geometry, as well as, well as his in general interest in the arts and intellectual activities. Um, it is thought that he spoke five languages, including Arabic, Persian, Turkic, Mongolian, and a little bit of Chinese. And during Olubek's rule, first as a governor of Samarkand and later as a governor of the whole Central Asian land of the Timurid Empire, um, the Timurid Empire achieved the cultural peak of Timurid Renaissance. Um, Mirza Olubek was the builder of the greatest observatory in the Central Asia. This is, uh, you can see the image right here. It's the part of um, his observatory, which, you, which tourists basically can visit today. Um, it was considered by scholars to be one of the finest observatories in the Islamic world. Imagine that, it's the 15th century. And um, it was, at the time, it was the largest in whole over um, Asian continents. Uh, so, and a fun fact, by the way, Mirza Lubik determined the length of the sidereal year with a great accuracy, which deviates from modern calculations by only 58 seconds. Um, yeah, so this was a very you know, quick, um, let's say quick rundown through uh, Uzbek history, quick snapshot of Uzbek history, and um, we'll dive into the geography. So the modern day Uzbekistan, as you can see here, uh, is one of the, uh, I, I'm not sure if you guys can see uh, the images because I think uh, this blocks it. What do you think? Can you guys see it? Uh, okay, I hope you do. Okay, um, so modern day Uzbekistan is one of the two double landlocked countries in the world. The other one being the Principality of Liechtenstein, which is located in Europe. And the great rivers that I was talking about, if you can see here, uh, it's a Sirdaria and Amudaria right here. So the land between two rivers, Maura Nahar or Transoxiana, all, all that refers to this particular piece of land that um, we call today Uzbekistan. So it is located right in the heart of Central Asia. We are neighboring with Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Afghanistan. And uh, Uzbekistan um, uh, is the second largest country of Central Asia by population. Uh, currently it consists of 12 um, states or, or yeah, we can call them states or districts. Uh, we call them Viloyats. So it's, we have 12 Viloyats and one autonomous Republic of Karakal Pakistan, which you can see here, right here. So, okay. Which takes us to the conversation of, uh, about the Uzbekistan's flag today. So as you guys can see, we have um, 12 stars depicted right here and they, um, um, let's say symbolize 12 Viloyats of Uzbekistan, just like an American flag, <laughs> apparently. And this is a crescent moon, which uh, symbolizes the rebirth of Uzbek nation because Uzbekistan has gained its independence in 1991. So it's relatively young country. So um, this was the time when Uzbek people realized that we can be independent from the Soviet rule. We can, um, let's say, there's, it's a time of a rebirth of the nation, basically. So this all represented on our flag. And also the colors that you can see here, blue, white, green, and red also have their certain meanings. So blue is um, peaceful blue sky. Then we have white is the color of justice. And the green is a fer fertile land that we have and hospitality of Uzbek people. All right, so. Talking about people, um, as you already know, Uzbekistan has a very rich uh, history and it has many, many layers. So our people and our culture was heavily influenced by those historic periods. So um, 
it can be seen today through the architecture. We try to maintain uh, the architectural styles, although um, let's say um, the cities have been modernized, everything is different right now with, you know, with the pace of globalization, it's getting different, but we try to preserve what we have, all the historical sites and um, the most beautiful sites um, belong to the period of Islamic golden age, as you can see with the, with the domes, with the crescent moon on top um, and things like that in architecture. And official language uh, is Uzbek. Um, Uzbek language belongs to the Turkic family of languages. Uh, and it's spoken by 85% of population of modern Uzbekistan right now. Um, yeah, and most of the representatives of all generations also speak Russian because Uzbekistan was part of the Soviet Union for over 70 years. And then before that, it also was under the, um, the uh, rule of Russian empire uh, following the conquest in 19th century. So yeah, we have very many layers of the history. So all of us are, uh, influenced in certain ways. So we still speak Russian, we still, our parents, our grandparents be, still speak Russian and we teach our children to speak Russian too. Um, but the state language, official language is Uzbek. So almost all of the population speaks Uzbek. So there are a lot of um, ethnic groups that live in, currently in Uzbekistan. Um, they include Uzbeks, Tajiks, Russians, Kazakhs and Koreans and Karakalpaks and other, other nationalities, including, we still have Greek people, by the way. <laughs> okay. The culture, as I said, has been greatly influenced by the historical periods. And um, um, I will show you some of the pictures of the architecture, but I think before that we have a little um, YouTube video that I embedded here that would depict national costumes of Uzbek um, people. Um, as I said, we have 12 vilayats and all of the vilayats have some distinct features that are represented on their um, national uh, outfits, national costumes. And uh, let's try to see, at least watch a little snapshot. Um, okay. Okay, there you are. Can you guys see? Okay, so Aziza, I think you're gonna have to stop screen share and then share the YouTube video because it's outside of the PowerPoint. We can only see well, hold on a second. the PowerPoint. I hear the music though. Yeah, hold on. Hold on. So I need to stop screen share. Mm -hmm. So you'll stop screen share and then you'll start again with the YouTube page. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Okay. Can you guys see it now? Not yet, you have to Not close yet. it first. Okay. Do you know how to close it? How there we go, yes. There we, now we can see it. Okay, Ooh. great. Awesome. Pretty. So, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you so much. So um, the video is five minutes long. I'm not sure we can watch it all, but at least I'll, I'll leave a video, a link to the video in the chat box later, but uh, we can just um, watch at least a couple of costumes um, now because we have another video to watch at the end of the presentation. So let's go. So this is the image of um, women of capital city, Tashkent. It's followed by um, Tashkent region costume. You see a little cap, a lot of jewelry. And this is a national song, which was uh, modernized in a way, <laughs> add some beats and stuff. And, um, you know, it's a modern take on national music. The head pieces are different. Our women used to wear these long, um, hair, we would braid them very long. Um, and 
very, very colorful. Are there um, any particular like gems or uh, stones that are specific? Yes, uh, so um, can I just pause the video for a second? Yeah, so yeah, the most um, I think widely used is the, I'm not sure how to say it in English, but um, the blue stone that is... Um, um, Sapphire? Um, Sapphire is one of the stones, but that one particularly is, um, is you know, it's not um, transparent, it's, or let's say it's more opaque. So um, I think the lady wearing- the Yeah, blue, I saw that. Yeah, right I'm here. A, yeah. a jewel yeah. fan. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of, I'm not sure, um, yeah. But don't I'll worry if you don't know off the top yeah. of your head. I yeah, was just, yeah, yeah, I just don't know the English names. I'm sorry mm -hmm. about that. But I can tell them in Russian. It's called Lazurit in Russian. Um, yeah. Okay. Let me. Um, did I stop sharing the screen? Oh, okay. Sorry about that. It's getting messy here. All right. So I'll go back to the presentation. Where is it? Okay. Should be right here. Okay. Are we good now? Okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit off about Uzbek cuisine. Can you guys hear me now? I don't think so. Okay, perfect. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I minimized the screen so I didn't see the thumbs up. Thank you so much. So bread, bread plays a very important role in our lives. And this is actually the first thing that we bring to the table when we have uh, guests. So whenever you visit Uzbekistan and whenever you go and visit any Uzbek family, the very first thing we'll bring to the table will be bread because that shows the hospitality of the family. And this is something that plays a very a key role in our, um, I guess, cultural and historical heritage. So we all share, um, Uzbek cuisine apparently show, uh, shares the culinary traditions of Turkic people across Central Asia. There is a great deal of grain farming in Uzbekistan, which can be seen uh, in this picture. Um, maybe I should have taken a better picture of, of Uzbek food, but um, I'll try to talk a little bit more in, in more detail about all the dishes that you can uh, see in this. So um, the signature dish of Uzbekistan is plov. Uh, we call it palov, osh, there it has many names, but um, I think in, in Uzbek restaurants in the US I've heard people calling it pilaf. So you may be familiar with that. So it consists of typically uh, rice and chunks of meat. It can be mutton because it's the um, popular variety of the meat in Uzbekistan due to the abundance of sheep in the country. So, so it's mutton a lot of times, but it can be substituted with any different uh, types of meat too. Um, rice, grated carrots, it's right here, um, and onions. And also plov also has many different variations across all vilayats because um, everyone has the, their own style of uh, making this uh, plov. Or osh. It's typically cooked in a big kazan uh, over an open fire and you can add chickpeas, uh, raisins, or other things to um, enhance the flavor of the dish, uh, depending on um, the personal, let's say, the personal take of the dish, let's say. Um, so it is one of the main courses that we make when we have big gatherings such as weddings. And we also have this custom that's called Nahorgi Osh, which means uh, the morning plov. And it's served early in the morning from typically from six to 9 a.m. in the morning. And it's for large gatherings of people, of guests, typically as part of um, ongoing wedding celebrations. Um, yeah, and um, it's, um, cooked by Oshpas or Master Chef or Osh Master Chef, uh, who cooks the national dish over an open fire in a huge, huge pot. And it sometimes the dish can, the, the, the whole pot can get as big. So um, it can serve up to a thousand people. Um, 
in a single, you know, college run. And there are other YouTube videos. Um, I'm not sure if I included the link. No, I did not. But um, you can look, um, maybe I'll, I'll try to show you some of the YouTube videos at the end of the presentations that shows the huge cauldrons where they make this huge um, plough for big gatherings. So other notable dishes that we have also short bites right here. It is a soup made of large pieces of um, mutton, yeah, lamb and fresh vegetables. And we also have um, lagman right here. I'm not sure if you can see this up here. Um, yeah, lagman is um, typically a noodle dish that have also many variations. It's uh, another uh, variation right here. It's a fried lagman. And it somehow uh, reminds me of a Chinese lo mein, uh, you know, thick noodles with uh, crispy vegetables and some meat. So it's really good. And also another type of uh, the dishes is we have here is manti. This is typically um, dough that's filled with minced meat and onions and some spices in it. And it's cooked in, in a thing called mantikaskan over the steam. So it's a steamed um, dumpling, we can say. So, um, and what we have here, uh, it's a, I'm sorry about the quality of the picture, but it is samsa. Samsa is a pastry, uh, but not exactly pastry in a, because it's not typically sweet, but it's a um, dough that's made in, in a way that it has many, many layers and very, very crispy. And that pocket is filled with uh, some minced meat and onions, or it can be uh, mixed with pumpkins, depending on, um, depending on the availability, let's say, <laughs> or the preferences. So the main thing, uh, main uh, beverage that is served along with Uzbek dishes is green tea. Uh, but Tashkent City people prefer black tea sometimes. Although I come from Tashkent, I was born in Tashkent, but I still like green tea too. So I don't know, it's probably, um, who's calling me home? So yeah, so green tea is the main um, beverage that is served together with Uzbek food. Okay. And yeah, we have um, tea houses that are called chaihanas that are spread around the country. Those are very popular gathering places for men mostly uh, where they hang out, where they change news and they drink tea, have plov and, you know, um, let's say um, Uzbekistani variation of a pub um, with green tea. Okay, so another, um, oh, oh, we also have iron. I don't have a picture of it, but uh, we also have iron. This is a chilled yogurt drink. It's typically served in summer because it's, um, it's, it's chilled apparently and it's um, um, good for some summer hot days, uh, which takes me back to the climate and geography. I think of Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan is the country that has 300 sunny days per year and it's very hot and the, the climate is more dry. So iron is a good thing to drink in summer. <laughs> All right. All right, so let's move on to the next, oops. So sites, as I said earlier, um, our historical heritage influenced our architecture very heavily, which can be seen in modern day Tashkent uh, or other um, country uh, or, or other vilayats as well. This is particularly the, the image that I included here is the image of Tashkent Metro or subway station. Um, I, oh yeah, I, I also have this, hold on a second, just give me a second so that I could, I could play the video. Um, the thing um, about the Uzbek Metro is that um, it was, illegal to take pictures in Uzbek metro because it was considered, um, let's say, a military installation due to, the, due, due to its you know, secondary role of a nuclear bomb shelter some time ago. And it's been only a, a more, I think more than a year since it's been allowed to take pictures of Tashkent metro. And the reason why I want to show you this is, um, just give me a second. Um, I'm trying to load the video, I'm sorry, it's taking so long. Yeah, sharing my screen. Okay, there we 
get rid of this. Can you guys see it? Okay. So, Tashkent Metro is um, um, the seventh one built in the USSR. It was opened in 1977, I believe. And it is only one of the two subway systems that exist in Central Asia. And the stations are considered one of the most ornate in the world. So in particular, um, we pay a great deal of attention to um, um, the ornaments. You see it and um, uh, they're made, depending on the name of the station, every station is dedicated to either a certain person or a certain period in Uzbekistan history. This particular one that I'm pointing at shows, uh, it's called Ali Sher Nawai, and it is dedicated to um, the greater, uh, greatest poet of Turkic um, culture or heritage, uh, Ali Sher Nawai. He is considered to be a father of modern Turkic or Uzbek language. So he's a great poet, he has many um, works that we learn in our school. So this is dedicated to him and um, um, yeah, the Stellas, I don't think that you can see the Stellas, but um, they show pictures of, from his uh, famous poems and um, his works. This one is dedicated to the Soviet era. This is Valentina Tereshkova, one of the first um, uh, astronauts um, of Soviet era um, and things like that. So, um, yeah. Okay, just go back to my espresso. Okay, Aziza, we're at 1030, so we've got a couple more minutes to wrap up. We had someone who had to leave. Just wanted to let you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, I think we're, we're pretty much done right now. Yeah, so we're pretty much done. And uh, I can't skip. Yeah. So these basically, I included some pictures of our architecture. This is in Samarkand. This one is Bukhara, ancient gates and arc, uh, the, the great walls of the city. And this is Samarkand. Uh, this is the Registan Square, um, where the entrances to all madrasas were. And this is one of the main sites in Samarkand. You can go there, you can walk into the madrasas, go into the um, all the buildings and, you know, feel the ancient history. Um, it's very well preserved. Um, also, this is the modern, uh, let's say not modern, but it also, uh, this, these are the images of Tashkent where, um, uh, the reason why I included these pictures in that because uh, apparently we had a Soviet era when, um, let's say there was no religion at all, but before that there was a, Soviet, a Russian empire period when um, the Christianity was introduced. So we have Christian Orthodox churches. We have, I think this is a chapel of Sacred Heart. This is, I think it's Catholic uh, church. And this is the image of the big um, theater of opera and ballet in Tashkent where we have really great performances. And here's the video why you should visit Uzbekistan, but I'll put the link into the chat box so that you guys could see. And yeah, I think we're good. And um, um, I think, um, did I stop share screen? So feel free yeah, to ask you. questions. You did a wonderful job. Thank great. you. So beautiful. I want to go. Beautiful. Thank you. Let me quickly, quickly, quickly add, um, um, I stopped share screen, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the, um, I just wanted to sh add the link so that you guys could watch this video. Not sure if you've heard about these guys. They're called, um, oh, hold on, Vaga, Vaga Brothers. And they have done a really good job of, um, okay. Why do I have so many open windows? Mm -hmm. Sorry. It's okay. The videos. All right. So feel free to ask questions. Yeah. Thank there it you. Is. Yeah. Do we have any questions for Aziza? That was excellent. I put a few actually in the chat box as you were talking. Oh, sorry about that. I'll let no, that's okay. I just was thinking about the hair, you know, in the, the traditional dress. Mm -hmm. Were those women, was that their natural hair or was that like? Yes. Yes, it was. 
Um, wow. Let's, um, oh, sorry about this. Uh, oh my God, I was trying to get the link for you guys. Sorry, <laughs> get it played on. Uh, okay, there is it. Oh, thank you, Sujin. <laughs> so here's the link to the costume video. Yeah, so um, uh, when we're little, a lot of times our parents want us to grow our hair long so that they can braid them and then so that we could have, you know, those cute long braids. And then um, apparently I also had some longer hair when I was a kid. And we would wear these national costumes and we do traditional dances while growing up in school. So yes, we try to maintain our cultural heritage. I mean, but as we grow older, we tend to cut our hair off. So it's, that's a, I, I have an excuse. I say, I'm too, I'm a, I'm a busy mom. So I need my hair short. I don't want to spend too much time on my hair. But yeah, um, typically women used to have longer hair back in the day, but um, and some of the little girls do still. So yeah, it's their hair. Wow, thank you. Yeah. Oh, and I said, where can we find some ethnic Uzbek food in Chicago if we want to get some? <laughs> yeah, that's too. a good question. That's a very good question yeah. be because um, when we moved to Chicago area, we were also looking for a good you know, good place to, to you know, experience the authentic food. And there was this place, this tip, I think this is not an Uzbek place, but there is, a, you know, our history is intertwined with all the cultures. It's a Kyrgyz place. Mm -hmm. And um, when we went there um, and we tried all the food, essentially we have everything the same. I think all the pilaf, maybe they also have dumplings because everything on the menu looked like very, very Uzbek to me at least. So, mm -hmm. and when we tried all the food, it tasted really, um, you know, it really reminded me of Tashkent, old city, where you go and mm -hmm. try out, you know, different um, dishes. So this is a Kyrgyz place and I believe it's called, oh yeah, and the, the main thing was that the, the chef that was cooking that day, he was Uzbek. And I was oh. like, okay, that's what it comes from. <laughs> yes. So yeah, they have opened another place um, in um, Glenview. Uh, it's, okay. it's a pretty big place, but uh, the it's main- like Korea, That's like my Korean market area. So I go to the Korean markets in Glenview. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to remember its names. Uh, let me let me just quickly. I'm googling it. Let's see if we can find it. Uz, or should we say Kurt? Kurt. You can say Uzbek food. It will look. Will yeah. I find it? Uzbek food. Uzbek yeah. food. Near me. <laughs> That's what I do. Google Maps. Oh yeah, Jibek Jolu. Jibek Jolu. Jibek Jolu. Okay, place. I see it. Yeah. Jibek Jolu. Jibek Jolu is not an Uzbek word, but I understand what that means because it's obviously Turkic. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephanie. It means Silk Road. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're all connected. Mm -hmm. We're all mm -hmm. I think so. This means Silk Road. And yeah, they had really wonderful kebabs, by the way. They're Ooh. so good. Yeah, Let's go for go. the lamb one. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and plov and samsa. They had tandir samsa. Tandir is, uh, it's like, uh, you maybe have heard about this, the, the, the tandoor that Indians have. It's uh, like an oven, that clay oven. So mm. yes. we also have those things where we bake our bread or we also bake our samsas inside that tandoor. So it's, wow. one. so these guys have the, really great tandir samsa. We call it tandir. But tandir. Yes. Tandir samsa. Uh, tandir. Sa. Or samsa. This hmm. one. Yeah. It's a really good one. Wow. And the one in Glenview, do you remember what it's called? It's the same. It's Jibek Jolu. Oh, they have, it's yeah, they have, they okay. a bigger place in Jibek Jolu. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. The one in Chicago is a smaller one. It's made, you know, it's um, made in uh, in a uh, at least the decorations remind you of a Kyrgyz yurta or Kyrgyz. Uh, um, I'm not sure how to say this in English, but um, the house that's not built of bricks but is made of fabric, like a I tent. Tent, yeah, <laughs> thank mm -hmm. you. So it is decorated as a tent, as if you're sitting in a tent, but mm -hmm. um, the one in Glenview is a more, um, um, 
it's a different ambience. You you gotta okay. go and just see it for yourself. So I'm pretty. looking at pictures. It looks so pretty inside. Yeah. It's almost like wooden screens, uh -huh. like wood, but there's like holes in it. So it looks kind of like a like a screen mm -hmm. or open mm -hmm. window. Mm -hmm. So cool. Thank you. You're welcome. So we can experience more of Uzbek culture through the food. So, yeah. I hope you guys have learned something new. I hope it was useful for you guys. And thank you so much for joining in and bearing with me. <laughs> while did a great I was job. Throwing all the facts. Good, Asisa. It was really good. It was very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Okay. I'm going to stamp our recording.